In this video, I'll show you how to commission an underfloor heating system, and I'll show you how to set the flow on flow meters, how to set the pump, and how to set the blending valve so we get incorrect temperatures on the manifold. Usually, the commissioning process goes something like this. Manual, pin it. Pump, whack it to maximum. Flow meters, well, set them so there's flow, but maybe between one and two liters, because Mike on the forum said so. The blending valve, maybe not on maximum, but somewhere at 70% so it's warm, I don't get cold bucks. You do all of that, go charge your money and disappear into the sunset. No, today we're gonna do it properly. And by the end of this video, I will also give you all the resources you should have. All the books, courses and other resources online that you can use if you need to find information in the future when you install your own underflow reading systems. Everything starts with the heat loss. Without heat loss, you can't adjust it correctly. If you have watched the installation video for uh, this manifold, you know that we've got a huge heat loss on this property of over 100 watts per square meter. If you haven't seen it, I'll post a link, go and watch that video maybe, and then come back to this one. We designed this area to provide 100 watts per square meter of uh, underfloor heating. So we're gonna cover 3.4 kilowatts from underfloor heating. And the remaining 1.3, 1.4 kilowatts will have to be supplemented by installing a radiator. If you want to know how to calculate floor output, there's an equation for that, and it goes like this. Floor output equals 8.92 multiplied by the difference of floor surface temperature minus room temperature to the power of 1.1. If you were to input the figures here, so for example uh, 8.92 multiplied by 30 degrees surface temperature minus 21 degrees room temperature leaves us 9 to the power of 1.1 you will see we're gonna get roughly around 100 watts per square meter if we run the manifold at the delta t which is the difference between flow and return of 7 degrees then the flow needs to be 33.5 degrees and the return needs to be 26.5 degrees however we have something called tog values tog values are the values of floor coverings which basically mean how insulating those coverings are and the more insulating the higher the top value the higher the flow temperature has to be to overcome the resistance of the floor so keep that in mind now to be able to set the flow meters to correct flows we first have to set the pump pump has to do two things it has to overcome the most restrictive circuit on the manifold which is going to be the longest length of pipe on that manifold and at the same time it has to provide correct flow through all the loops. Our longest loop is loop number one and it's 80 linear meters of pipe work. It also covers 12 square meters at 150 pipe centers. So for example at 150 uh, millimeters spacing we need 6.67 linear meters per square meter of pipe. So at 12 square meters we use around 80 linear meters of pipe work. So we know that. Second thing we need to know is the kilowatt output that this loop covers. If we have 100 watts per meter, we design it for 100 watts per meter and we have 12 square meters, we are covering 1200 watts or 1.2 kilowatts. With that information, we need to calculate how much water needs to flow through that loop. So the flow equals kilowatt output divided by delta T, which is the difference between flow and return in uh, degrees Celsius or Kelvin, multiplied by 4.2. What is 4.2? It's a specific heat capacity of water, so how much energy that water can carry. So let's input our data into this equation. So we will have 1.2 kilowatt divided by 7, that's multiplied by 4.2. That equals 7 divided by 29.4. And the result is 0 0.0408 and that's expressed in liters per second. So that loop will have to carry 0.04 liters per second. Flow meters are in liters per minute, so we have to multiply that result by 60 to get our flow per minute. So if we multiply that by 60, we're gonna get 2.44 liters a minute. And that's actually what we will have to set this flow meter to, roughly about 2.4 liters a minute. Now we have to find a chart that will show us a pressure drop through a 16 millimeter PEX pipe work at that flow of 2.4 liters a minute. 
a pressure drop through 16 mil pipe work at that flow is 15 millimeters per linear meter. So now we have to multiply 15 millimeters times the length of pipe work, which is 80 meters, and we're gonna get 1200 millimeters pressure drop or 1.2 meters pressure drop. And that's our index circuit for this manifold and the pump has to overcome a resistance of 1.2 meters. Now we have to only worry about the longest circuit because as long as the pump can overcome the longest circuit the other circuits will work fine as well. We don't add those up. The second thing we need to know is the total flow through the manifold. Now those two remaining loops they cover 11 square meters each. Each of them is about 73 linear meter of pipe work. So we're gonna do our equation Again, calculate flow for those loops and it's 11 kilowatts divided by 7 delta T of underfloor heating multiplied by 4.2 will have a result of 2.24 liters a minute. Remember to multiply the result that comes in uh, liters per second by 60 when you're done to get liters per minute. So now we know that the first loop was 2.44 liters a minute, second loop is 2.24 and the third loop is exactly the same, 2.24 liters a minute as well. If we add all the three loops together, so 2.44 plus 2.24 plus 2.24, we're going to get a total flow through the manifold of 6.92 liters a minute. Now to confuse us even more, the pump charts we're given are in liters per hour, so we have to multiply that result yet again by 60, so 60 minutes. In an hour and you get your liters per hour if you do that you'll see that we need to pump 415 liters per hour through that manifold to get 100 watts per square meter of output or 3.4 kilowatt of total floor output at delta the difference between flow and return of 7 and that gives us all the information required to set the pump now find that manual you've been earlier dig it out from the bin and find a pump chart. It should look something like this. I'll post it on the screen to make it easier. On horizontal axis, you will get your flow through the pump in liters per hour, or in our case, cubic meters uh, per hour, which is 1000 liters per hour. On the vertical axis, you will get the head available of the pump. And if you look at the chart, you'll see at 0.4 cubic meters per hour, we're getting around 2.5, 2.7 pump head available. And we only need 1.2 meters. So which setting would you choose? Look at the chart and you can see that you can easily choose the setting number one because it provides us with more head than we need anyway. So no need to run the pump any higher than the setting one. Go to the pump and drop it from three to one. Put the pump set correctly, we can set the flow meters. To do that, we have to turn the manifold pump on by turning the thermostat on or doing it manually here and then adjust the flow meters. To adjust the flow meters, you remove those red caps and turn them anti-clockwise to increase the flow or clockwise to decrease the flow. Obviously, you can't be that accurate on those flow meters, so we'll adjust them to slightly over 2 liters a minute. So my floor surface is 13 degrees right now. The pump's running on setting 1. Flow meter is set slightly above 2 liters per minute. So right now I'm getting flow of 34 degrees and return of 22, so the delta of 12. But that's because the floor is still really, really cold. So I have to wait for the floor to heat up fully to uh, my design temperature of 30 degrees. Once it heats up, then we can check the delta T, which I bet will drop to around 7, 8. One of my clamps broke, so I'll have to fix it. A little longer than a few minutes later. So my flow is 33 degrees, so I have to move the clamp to the return to see what the return temperature is. So I'm expecting minus 7, so 34 minus 7 is 27. 26, that's pretty much spot on. Let's go back to the office to talk about the resources. Now I'm going to give you the resources that I use uh, in my day-to-day -day work. First of them is Domestic Heating Design Guide by SIPSI. So this book is done by SIPSI and SIPSI is a chartered institution of building services engineers and they provide excellent information. Uh, maybe not the easiest to uh, understand or digest, but there is 
loads of information in this book. However, it does not talk much about underfloor heating. There's another book from Sipsy, and that's Underfloor Heating uh, Design and Installation Guide. It's not a very big book, it has, I think, about 70 pages. And in this book, again, it repeats heat loss similar to Domestic Heating Design Guide, and it explains processes of design, installation and commissioning of wet underfloor heating systems. The equation for calculating underfloor heating output comes that I use in the video uh, is in this book as well. It explains torque values that I mentioned in the video as well. There is also a chart explaining pressure loss in pipe work that we use to calculate our index circuit. And those books, both of those books uh, from CPC, they are great. I think any heating engineer should have them in their uh, technical library. However, they're not an easy read and it's not easy to learn from those books. They are great as a reference material if you have to find pressure drops on pipe work, if you need to find your uh, U or R values for heat loss, everything you need to calculate heat loss and design central heating systems, everything is in those two books. So they are highly recommended. However, if you are new to the subject, I would still buy those books, but I would not be starting with the books. That's where the courses come in. This is the course that I recommend to everyone. It's Northampton Heating Academy run by Kim. See the book for the course, the booklet, it's quite actually small. There is only 40 pages here. But what Kim does, he's excellent at taking the most important topics that you need to know as a heating engineer and really drilling them in your head over two days of doing a lot of practice exercises. The course is excellent value for money. I think it's around 200 pounds for two days on-site training 8 a.m. till 6 p.m. when I went there. He couldn't get us out. Everyone wanted to stay and get as much information as we could. Banter's excellent as well. Kim's banter's very good, very good. Uh, so I think this is what you should start with. Sign yourself up as soon as you can to Kim's course. Once you've done it, you will know how to use those Sipsy books. You will understand what's going on in them because without any introduction to the subject, it might be a bit difficult. And once you've done Kim's course, once you went through the books or kept them in your library as a reference, then you go and sign yourself up to this course. And it's a two-part course done by Adam from HeatGeek. I will post a link to this course in the video and in the description. And this goes really in depth into uh, installation practices and uh, calculations of uh, domestic heating systems. And pretty not domestics, because the principles are universal. And it's a hard course. Some people take uh, weeks to do it, maybe even months. And that course is different from Kim's course. You do it online, you do it in your own time. But once you've gone through that course, you really gain a deep understanding of how most of the principles of central heating systems and domestic hot water systems operate. But the sequence would be, Kim first, buy the books as a reference for your library, and then do the heat key course. On top of that, there's a lot of online forums where you can get information as well. However, that information will be fragmented and not always accurate. It's great to have done those courses. It's great to have books as, as your reference. And if you hit an obstacle, a concept that you can't grasp, then you go to forums, then you go online. And HitGeek has its own uh, Facebook forum as well. And it's only for people that finish the course. So you are quite reassured that you are talking to people that have gone through the material and quite often they've got excellent knowledge and excellent ways of explaining problems that are hard to grasp. I would also recommend the Combustion Chamber. Hi guys, because it's a great forum with very knowledgeable engineers that they have been helpful to me over the years and I've been there for probably seven, maybe eight years now. So thank you guys for all your help as well. I've learned loads on Combustion Chamber. Hope that answers your questions. Hope that helps you uh, on your way to becoming a better uh, hitting engineer. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, please subscribe and I'll see you soon.